Ah, RMS Taylor, the infamous ship of the White Star Line that tragically sank on her maiden voyage. Ah, RMS Titanic, the ill-fated liner, the one with four funnels, the Rosie and Jack boat. However you remember Titanic in your own mind, one thing is almost certain, you've probably heard of it. But what has caused this vessel in particular to become a household name? And more importantly, does it deserve to be? I'm going to ramble on for a bit about why Titanic draws so much attention in relation to other famous ships that missed the boat, some of which didn't even sink. Naturally, any disaster deserves to be honoured for those who lost their lives, and remembered so that future accidents may be prevented. Indeed, much was learnt from the Titanic tragedy in terms of maritime safety, and regulations introduced as a consequence have no doubt saved thousands of lives as a result. Sadly though, the sinking of the Titanic is just one of many shipping disasters. 1,496 people perished in the North Atlantic in April 1912, and almost all have lived on through their names being respectfully remembered due to the ship's fame, little did they know at the time. Unfortunately though, this isn't the most lives lost at sea, so the disaster isn't a record holder in that respect. Taking an agonising 2 hours 40 minutes to go under, she was hardly the fastest or slowest ship of her size to sink either nor was she the fastest ocean liner at 23 knots. It didn't collide with another vessel, or run aground, blow up, burn in a fire, well, you know, hold the most passengers, or get torpedoed. She wasn't even the first or last of her kind, so why is Titanic so famous? I should probably get on to talking about that. Starting with the basics, Titanic was the largest vessel in the world when she was launched. Keeping in mind that at this stage, nobody knew of the soon-to-be wreck of the Titan, I mean, <laughs> wreck of the Titanic. Even being the biggest ship to hit the water, it didn't attract the mass media attention that one might think. This is because only two years earlier, the Titanic's older sister, Olympic, was launched. Yes, there was more than one. Conspiracy? <gasps> no. Being the first of the three highly anticipated Olympic-class liners, Olympic was the one that drew the crowds and got press coverage galore. Sorry to ruin everything you know, but most documentary footage that claims to be of Titanic is in fact of Olympic. Conspiracy? <gasps> Probably not. From the outset, Olympic was White Star's showpiece, being launched painted in white just to stand out in the photos. 20th century Instagram ships for you right there. Titanic was, in effectiveness, just more of what was already in the water, so wasn't pressed as much with the press. Much like how the Flying Scotsman was never envisioned to be the most famous railway engine when it was built, and wasn't the first of its kind either, fame just happened over time. Although they were the same size in length, Titanic became the world's biggest ship by default because she weighed more than Olympic at 46,328 tonnes compared to 45,324 tonnes due to several fitting modifications. Therefore, Titanic was also the largest ship to sink at the time. Titanic, um, who? Full of the name? It was chosen as the most famous vessel of the planet Earth. Did they tell you why it was famous? One thing that historians like to mock is the fact that for a ship of such size, it's alarming that there wasn't enough lifeboats for even half of the passengers on board. In defence of White Star, the ship had more lifeboats than the Board of Trade required at the time, as they were primarily intended to ferry passengers to rescuing vessels or to land in the event of an emergency, rather than act as their only salvation. In defence of common sense, assuring that there's a space for every passenger sounds like a great idea. I mean, rather that than prioritise giving first-class passengers more deck space to look at the sea, after several days of looking at nothing but the sea. Perhaps as a result of Titanic's popularity, people love to either idolise the ship's grandeur or criticise the technicalities of the design, because, you know. For instance, one of the most talked about bits of trivia is that of the four iconic funnels, only three of them were speech marks, real speech marks, comma, and the fourth was simply a dummy to give the illusion that the ship was bigger than it seemed, in order to compete with Cunard's four-funneled Lusitania and Mauritania. <laughs> oh, how Freudian. Boyd, who is he? Is he a passenger? Others praised the introduction of the bulkheads and watertight doors, preventing the spread of flooding, whilst other others scrutinised that the fact that these didn't go up all of the decks was the reason that the design failed. In terms of aesthetics alone, the Olympic class were certainly smart-looking liners, which is what White Star Line wanted them to be remembered for. 
unlike the contemporary Cunard rivals, which had inconsistent segmented blocks with little bridges across them and, and the lines on the hull don't stay level and a uh, white star line's answer was an elegant design with far cleaner lines whilst still having a forward and aft well deck. However, as a passenger, you only really look at the ship from the outside for a few moments and it's what's inside that counts as you live on board for about a week. Interior-wise, to say everyone remembers the staircase sounds like a strange claim, but when you mention it's the Grand Staircase, then this is what comes to mind. Or the second one. Not all liners in this era had big, English manor house style staircase focal points like this, so when you put one, or two, like this on a ship, then it easily makes it the most recognisable part. Even on cruise ships today, there's almost always a photo backdrop of the Grand Staircase for formal nights, which is slightly ominous I suppose. White Star prioritised luxury over speed, and treated passengers of each class better than the equivalent on rival fleets. So was it the most luxurious ship of its time? Up for debate depending on taste of course, but it did have electric potato peelers in the galleys, so that speaks volumes to me. Also, as a side note related to luxury, as a child I always imagined that the four funnels had the ship equivalent of a top hat, and that amusingly made me remember it a lot more. Case closed, my dears. Why couldn't I have been a liner, I wonder? But alas, Titanic is not famous because it was a ship, but because it was a ship that sank. It's a shame, really, because as antiquated as it may seem by today's standards, it certainly was a triumph in shipbuilding in the early 1900s. Titanic wasn't doomed to fail from the start. Harland and Wolf hardly forgot to put the plug in the bottom, or remember to connect the rudder. More, it was a culmination of unlikely occurrences that breached the vessel's security measures. Even to this day, the people of Belfast are proud of their connection to Titanic, and they show the fancy new museum in almost every advertising campaign for Northern Ireland. It must be very upsetting when tourists visit and mock the celebration of a ship that didn't stay afloat. The fact that Titanic, the speech marks, practically unsinkable speech marks ship, comma, set sail on her maiden voyage and sank, is undoubtedly one of the two biggest reasons why it is remembered today. The irony of such confidence in human engineering being counteracted by Mother Nature within its first encounter is uh, striking to say the least. More so, the absurdity of the situation is what makes it remembered more than other sinkings. So many things just seem to go wrong. Icebergs weren't really considered a big threat in the North Atlantic, because ships were usually travelling slow enough to spot and avoid them. The somewhat abnormal conditions on the night of April 14th made the iceberg more difficult to see, and in attempting to turn, the hull was punctured in more compartments than the limit of four. The binoculars for the lookouts in the crow's nest were stuck in a locker, and the crew member who had the key had left the ship in Southampton. It was the middle of the night, in freezing conditions, and they were nowhere near land. Other ships were nearby, but either didn't respond to the distress calls, or were too far away to assist in time. Four hours. Calculating the damage and coming to the realisation that the ship was doomed took valuable time, and passengers weren't really told the true severity of the situation. Therefore, many precious lifeboat spaces were launched underfilled, and some crews refused to go back to pick up more people. The scheduled lifeboat drill had been postponed earlier that day, so crew and passengers alike were unfamiliar with the proceedings. Not that this would have eliminated all panic, but it certainly didn't make evacuation of the ship efficient. There was time for people to lay out their options, and either fight for survival or choose to accept their fate. This really sets the Titanic disaster apart from others, because it is the perfect real-world example of human compassion versus self-defence. A what-if scenario where the price you paid for a ticket and your place within the social hierarchy is what determined your chances of survival. But it's one that really happened. Women and children were prioritised, but this didn't stop some men dressing up in women's clothes just to get a spot in a boat. Family and friends were torn apart, and many swimming in the water were prevented from boarding a boat. It was a disaster for humankind in terms of decency, let alone a tragedy in terms of loss of life. However, on the other side, there are several acts of heroism that can be seen as glimmers of hope from the catastrophe. 
people such as Ida Strauss, who refused to leave her husband despite being offered a chance to survive, or the band, who stuck to their posts on deck to the very end and played music to calm the passengers. Captain Smith, Thomas Andrews, and even Bruce Ismay, who were all seen helping people into lifeboats, though they didn't have to. There's also many unsung heroes, like the stokers and engineers in the boiler and engine rooms below, who worked tirelessly to pump out seawater, and kept firing the boilers to keep the electricity on. This in turn meant that wireless operators Bride and Phillips were able to continue sending out SOS and CQD on the wireless to anyone nearby who would listen and further afield than would otherwise have been possible. Without such acts of selflessness, the number of lives lost could have easily have been far worse. Representations of the band, or the captain, and many others are referenced all over, which no doubt distinguish this tragedy in particular as being iconic and remembered, for better or worse. The truth behind such references is largely based on accounts from survivors, and, as a byproduct of Titanic's fame, extensive research has gone into accounting every detail possible of what truly happened that fateful night. Other disasters have not been so lucky. With Titanic, experts have enough information to calculate how long it took from spotting the iceberg to the actual impact, but with other ships of the era, it's still debated what actually caused them to sink at all. New information about Titanic is still being unearthed today, by those just dying to know what the pattern of the tiles was in so-and-so room, or where this particular person was when the ship went down. Whereas people who lost their lives in other sinkings go largely forgotten in the public eye. This isn't to say that those who perished on Titanic shouldn't be remembered, and indeed, many of their testaments have been taken for granted. For instance, there's the breakup. This in itself is an extraordinary aspect. The fact that the ship sank so perfectly balanced that it didn't capsize, but rather made the stern rise into the air at 30 degrees at very least, is remarkable. Then, as a result of the incredible strain on an area with several open interior spaces, the sight of the hull buckling and splitting in half must have been unbelievable. And yes, if you did live to see it, many people wouldn't believe you saw it. At the British and American inquiries following the sinking, officers protested the fact the ship split in two at all, probably to prevent fears that the hull was brittle and the design was unsafe. This is why fictional work pre-1985 shows the ship going beneath the waves in one piece, because their word was taken over the passengers and it couldn't be proved otherwise. It wasn't until 1985 that it could be confirmed that the hull did in fact snap, because the wreck, uncoincidentally, sits on the ocean floor in two pieces. Until Titanic was accidentally on purpose discovered by Ballard et al, the event was more of a distant legend than a gruesome reality. The discovery of the wreck reignited public interest and allowed for more accurate findings, leading to a little-known film called... The Movie. Yes, when you mention Titanic, you are most likely to be given a reference to the 1997 film rather than the real ship. Thankfully, I've never come across anyone who's asked, wait, the film's based on a real boat? But I bet there's people like that out there. I know they're out there. Whether you think this film is overrated or not, I really like it. I grew up with it, though I probably shouldn't have, and without a doubt, it's one of two reasons why I'm interested in ships today. Yes, there are inaccuracies, but with the budget it has, it's the closest we'll get to a recreation of the sinking. There's a lot to talk about with this, so I'll probably leave that for another time. It is important to talk about whether it's Titanic itself that's the appeal of the film, or the actual story. The main problem historians have with Cameron's Titanic is these two. Which is understandable, because the real people on the ship could easily hold their own storyline. It must be frustrating having a film that is branded around the thing that you love, but the plot actually focuses on a completely new work of fiction, and sidelines the characters and canon that you care about. Anyway, having said that, I still think that this is a tasteful way of tackling the film. To focus the entire plot on the real people would place greater risk of disrespecting those people, and we all know that media portrayal and betrayal are dangerous weapons. Instead, the real people form the surrounding world of a fictional story, 
in turn making the fictional fit within a more realistic context. Titanic, movie. the movie, isn't about Captain Smith uh, solving a murder mystery in the Turkish baths whilst dealing with a love triangle and sailing to find the legendary lost key to the crow's nest just to keep the viewers interested. It's about these fake characters who can do whatever they want, so long as it's bound within the genuine events that happened on board. I'm not saying that this film is perfect by any means, but it's definitely not trying to be a documentary and I don't believe it would have been such a success if it had been. The fact that so much care and attention went into getting accurate looking sets, in some cases the real thing, and a cast that genuinely looked like their real life counterparts is quite honourable. It's a shame that so much of it is left to the deleted scenes. James Cameron's Titanic was made because of the untapped potential based around the cultural following of the ship, and it certainly paid off. It's one of those films that you don't have to have seen to understand the references, and that's a triumph considering you know what's going to happen before you even hit play. As I say, focusing just on the true story, there are many inaccuracies and theories that have since been proved otherwise. Like, the Quartermaster is turning the ship the wrong way! Hard to starboard means turn the helm to the right, doesn't it? I mean, no wonder they crashed! But one good thing that the film showed on the big screen was just how awful a night this must have been for those on board, and without a doubt it skyrocketed the following of Titanic to a new generation. There are consequences of course. For instance, Titanic is now the victim of mass marketing and merchandising. Now it's possible to get Titanic coal and t-shirts and snow globes, and it seems it's more celebrated that Titanic sank rather than mourned. This has meant that there has been a greater demand for museums and restoration projects though. So this brings us to the question, is it a good thing that Titanic is so famous? Well for one, the wreck itself has suffered from this attention. Probably because of the lack of human remains at the site, explorers have often been rather careless when using their submersibles around the vessel. The general rule is that items from the debris field can be extracted but anything from the ship itself must be left intact. This hasn't stopped debates about salvage of particular items from the ship, such as from the Marconi wireless room more recently. On one hand, it's better that some of these artefacts are preserved, because the wreck is deteriorating fast, but on the other, is it disrespectful to remove items from what is essentially a mass gravesite? Much like the seemingly impossible task of raising the Mary Rose, for its name alone, Titanic stands a better chance than most others of being preserved as best it can, but is this for the sake of retaining its significance or to turn it into a tourist attraction? A good point of comparison when talking about Titanic is to turn to its two sister ships. The last of the trio, HMHS Britannic, was built after the original two and rectified some of the issues from the Titanic disaster, such as with the introduction of a double hull and electrically operated cranes to launch the lifeboats, which allowed more to be put on the deck. Britannic was intended to be an equally luxurious passenger liner, but was forced into World War I as a hospital ship. In November 1916, off the coast of Greece, the ship struck a mine and sank in less than half the time it took Titanic to sink, because the watertight doors had failed. Luckily, few people died in the sinking, but those who did did so in a pretty horrific way. Over a hundred years later, Britannic also lies on the ocean floor, but is comparatively easier to access being 122 metres underwater, making the wreck site able to be dived to in person. Britannic was discovered in 1975, some ten years before Titanic, but isn't talked about or explored like her older sister, despite in essence being a more modern version of the same ship. Then there's the first of the class, Olympic, which gains the nickname Old Reliable for being the only ship of the three to not sink, but instead enjoyed 24 years of hard working service. This isn't to say that it was plain sailing, because Olympic had plenty of bumps and scratches to her name. No other ocean liner can claim to have been punctured by a war destroyer, rammed down and claim victory against a German U-boat, and rammed down and claim responsibility of an American lightship. Being the eldest and nearly identical to Titanic, it's a wonder the ship had such a lengthy career. I find it quite amusing that when Titanic sank, Olympic, travelling in the opposite direction, offered to assist in the rescuing survivors. 
the offer was declined, seeing as the last thing traumatised passengers and crew would want to travel on is another of the same ship that had just sank beneath them. Olympic was scrapped in 1935, and like Britannic, is one of the most talked about ships, if you're interested in them, but is barely noted by the public outside of documentaries about Titanic. Two more versions of the Titanic in essence, which both lasted more than one trip, <laughs> but both are completely sidelined by the middle sibling. Off the top of my head, if I had to list five famous ships that I've heard of without research, then it would probably be Titanic, no surprises there, Lusitania, Queen Mary, Bismarck, and HMS Victory. This isn't a definitive and confirmed list of the most famous ships of all time, this is just my initial thoughts, but it is interesting that of these five, three of them are ships that have sunk. But this ship can't sink. In my mind, Titanic is partly famous because every subject naturally has a representative that is recognisable to an outsider. Sorry to bring up the same analogy twice, but if you're talking about trains and you mention Flying Scotsman, most people will know what you're referring to, even if you're somehow not into trains. Mention Titanic and people will always know you're referring to the ship, or the film about the ship. Over time, Titanic has come to represent ships as a whole, represent ship sinkings and shipwrecks. This is partly due to the fact that the sinking is largely considered to be the first viral news. With the age of steam came the rise of transportation, and suddenly the world felt a lot more interconnected than it had previously been prior to the Industrial Revolution. News could be printed in a paper and spread overnight worldwide. And an unprecedented catastrophe such as the sinking of the world's largest ocean liner on her maiden voyage was more than enough to make headlines. This grounded its cultural popularity, and is why even before the wreck was found, several books, films, poems, songs and plays were made of the doomed vessel. I do think it's unfair that so many other ships with arguably greater histories don't get much of the limelight. I mean, from launch to sinking, Titanic was only afloat for 319 days. But, as a flagship for... ships, I think it's a worthy candidate, and serves as a good gateway topic into maritime history in general. Is Titanic my favourite ship? If you'd asked younger me, then yes, I used to draw full-length versions of the ship on massive A3 sheets that joined together all the time. But as I've got older, my interest in Titanic has led me to find appreciation for other ships, ocean liner or not, and discovering their histories has given me many a sleepless night. For instance, if you were to ask me right now, I'd probably say my favourite ship is Queen Elizabeth, but I'm sure that'll change over time. Regardless, I still hold Titanic firmly in my heart, and I'm grateful that at least for all those who perished on that icy April night, their names will live on as a result of the ship's name. Thank you for watching that video, I mean, if you liked it, then great, if you didn't, then you watched it this far, so you must have liked it a little bit, right? I just wanted to talk about something different, and whilst I've been working on much bigger projects, talking about Titanic felt like a suitable thing to get away from all of that, especially since it's April, and uh, it's very relevant, obviously, Titanic this month. If you check in the description below, I have linked a site where you can watch the entire Titanic film, but only the parts that are about the ship and the real story, so no Jack and Rose, which I think is quite enjoyable. A big thank you to all of our lovely, lovely Patreon supporters, particularly Alex Goodman, GBH Train, Donald9 and Douglas10, D0280 Falcon, Sean Tempest, and Peter Davenport. 